Now let us discuss optical drives, which are CD, DVDs, and Blu-ray drives, Blu-ray discs. I'm sorry. So uh, the main issue with a hard disk is that, uh, well, a hard disk number one is not portable in the sense that, at least you know, most hard disks are not portable. So they are attached uh, to the desktop or the laptop. Even though you know there are a lot of portable hard disks nowadays as well which attach to the USB. But nevertheless, in general, hard disks are bulky devices. Second, they have mechanical parts. You know, it's very, very high sophisticated uh, engineering design that has gone into there. <sighs> also, you know, if you drop a hard disk, you can uh, damage the motors, you can damage the heads. So there's a lot of possibility of damage. So we want one, also, you know, it's expensive. That's the reason we need one inexpensive storage media, especially for things like movies and songs and so on. So that's where we use optical media, uh, which come in a variety of flavors. So we can have a CD drive, a DVD drive, a Blu-ray disc and so on. So the structure of an optical disc is like this, that it's actually a four layer structure. So uh, let's consider the bottom. So we have a laser that shines a uh, laser light on the disc, you know, as it rotates. So the physics here is also the same, that this is a rotating disc. And we have a polycarbonate layer. So the polycarbonate layer essentially protects one side of the recording surface. So light passes through the polycarbonate layer. So it is pretty much transparent to light. And after that, we have what is called a reflective layer. So a reflective layer, if you would notice, has, you know, these structures. <coughs> so these are called lands and pits. So pits are basically these holes and lands are, uh, you know, places where holes are not there. So this is a land, this is a land, and this is a pit, right? A pit, you know, from the English word, what is the connotation? The connotation is that it's a hole. And, uh, you know, so it's the same thing over here that we have a structure of lands and pits. And uh, all the logical bits, zeros and ones, are recorded in these lands and pits. So lands typically have a much higher reflectivity, so they will reflect the signal back, and a receiver can you know figure out that it's a land. Pits, in contrast, have a lower reflectivity, and also they induce a phase change. So basically, from the pattern of the reflected light, a receiver can see whether it's getting reflected from a land or a pit. After that, we have what's called a lacquer layer. So the lacquer layer is between the polycarbonate layer and, uh, so sorry, the refractive surface is between the polycarbonate layer and the lacquer layer. So the lacquer layer, in, in a sense, uh, gives support to the lands and pits. And finally, on top of the lacquer layer, we have a plastic layer called the surface layer. So this is a sheet of plastic which covers the CD or DVD. So here, you know, we can stick a piece of paper with the name of the movie or the name of the software. So this can be done. So the piece of paper with the name of the movie or the software goes over here. All right. So, so this is the structure. So uh, this is very similar the, you know, the encoding is basically via these lands and pits, which are essentially aberrations on the surface of this uh, lacquer layer, right? So this boundary between the lacquer and the polycarbonate layer has aberrations and these aberrations encode the logical bits. So let's look at the physical bits. So land, uh, lands represent the physical bit one. Pits represent the, uh, the physical bit zero. And uh, similar to almost all uh, I.O. devices, similar to hard disks, similar to USB, uh, we use the NRZI encryption scheme. Uh, and also, you know, there are methods for uh, clock recovery and so on. I mean, data recovery. So all of that is there. And there are very elaborate error protection codes, Reed Solomon codes. Because, you know, what can happen is if there is a scratch on the surface of the CD, then uh, the reflection of light might become irregular at these places. That's the reason there are extremely, you know, high performing and, you know, elaborate error protection codes. 
for uh, correcting the data. But the encryption scheme, we have been seeing this for a long time now. NRZI is the encryption scheme of choice. So let us look at the operation of an optical drive, where the operation is more or less the same uh, for all the optical drives, uh, CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays. So it has a very similar operation. So we have a spindle over here. So the CD, basically the CD over here, pretty much sits on the spindle. So you would have seen the small hole in the center. So that is for it to sit on the spindle. And the spindle has a spindle motor. So the CD rotates. All right. And uh, furthermore, we have a linear head. Uh, so this has a laser as well as a recording head which moves along these two uh, these two rails, right? So let me maybe erase the ink on the slide. So it moves along these two uh, rails. All right, so, so this uh, recording head moves along the rails and uh, so why does it move along the rails? So basically, if this is the undersurface of a CD, so the movement is pretty much radial. So recall that in the case of the hard disk, the movement was angular in the sense the movement was pretty much something like this. But in this case, the movement of the head is radial. So we can radially position ourselves at any point. And then, uh, you, you know, so this has a corresponding notion of sectors and tracks. So we can read the appropriate sector and track, even though the recording is different. Uh, sectors and tracks are organized in a different manner. So you'll find the details in the book. But the basic idea is the same. And so after deciphering the bits, it is sent via this electrical channel to the electronics of the drive. And uh, it takes the bits, does the framing, puts it into packets and sends it over the bus to the CPU. CPU or memory, but essentially out of the optical drive. So this is a very simple, this optical drive is also a mechanical component. But recall that uh, in a hard disk, this was a part of the hard disk. But in the case of an optical system, the optical drive part is actually a part of the host system, the laptop or the desktop. But the CD itself is a separate entity which just has a sequence of lines and pits, that's all. So that's the reason, you know, CDs and DVDs are very cheap. They can be burnt once. So the term is burning, writing a CD or DVD, the term is burning. So they can be burnt once. And then, you know, they can be distributed. So they can be shipped all over the world. Everything can be done with them. And you just need a CD or DVD reader to basically read them. So the idea is put it on the spindle spin the spindle and uh, after that uh, basically have the laser assembly here read the data out and to move it well uh, this is very simple this is essentially uh, moving uh, so there are like screws built in here and you know this thing looks like a screw so basically if you rotate this in one direction then the laser assembly will move in this direction if it is rotated in another direction, then the laser assembly will move in this direction. So uh, the main difference between the hard disk and the optical drive is like this, that the hard disk always rotates at a constant angular velocity. And the angular velocity, uh, well, the modern hard disk come in two uh, angular velocities, 5400 RPM and uh, 7200 RPM. All right. So uh, this sort of keeps things simple. Also note that hard disk technology is fairly old. So it has been around for at least the last 30 years. So in those days, having a fixed RPM motor was a fairly big thing and also you know a motor that reliably runs at 5400 rpm constructing that and making it economical was a massive challenge so ibm and you know, pioneers in ibm and seagate were essentially able to build one such device 
However, CDs and DVDs came much later, so the motor technology by that time had really become very advanced. So here what we have is we have constant linear velocity. Let's see what this is. So if you would recall your first year mechanics, you will find that V is equal to omega r, which basically means that let's say if there is a rotating disk and at any point with radius r, its linear velocity V is related like this that V is equal to the angular velocity right uh, times the radius. So what we did in the case of a hard disk is that we set the angular velocity to a constant. So in that case the linear velocity was not a constant because basically depending upon where the point is from the center uh, the linear velocity was higher. If the linear velocity is higher, it means that bits passed more quickly under the head uh, as we moved out, right? Because as R increased, V increased. So more quickly, you know, bits passed under the head. However, uh, if we consider points that are closer to the center, there the linear velocity was lower. As a result, sensing changes in the magnetic field and so on have to be done at different speeds for both of these points, this point and this point. In compare, so this introduced some complexity. So there was a scheme called zo uh, zoning to take care of it. It is still being used. I have not discussed zoning uh, in the lecture, fearing that it will become too complicated, but zoning is there in the book. So uh, you know, for those interested, take a look at it in the book. But in the case of a CD, it is much easier. Well, the complexity lies somewhere else. So we keep V constant. So to keep V constant, as we increase the radius, means as we go outwards, the angular velocity has to decrease. And as we come inwards, the angular velocity increases. So this will basically make the spindle motor very sophisticated, that now it has to rotate in a you know, huge spectrum of speeds to essentially ensure that the linear velocity as perceived by the head is constant. So this motor will be extremely sophisticated. But once we are able to get this kind of sophistication in the motor, uh, so it, where the motor will change its speed or RPM depending on the position of the head, the linear velocity or the rate of bits passing under the head will be the same. So the head can actually be very simple as compared to the hard disk head. Uh, the head in this case can actually be very, very simple. And uh, that will be to our advantage, mainly because the head has other things as well. It has a laser and it has circuitry to analyze the reflected light, right? And also it has to figure out the sequence of bits in NRZI scheme. So keeping all of these things in mind, having a simpler head is definitely a great idea. And we also don't have to implement techniques such as zoning because at any, at any radius, we are sure that the rate of bits passing under the head is the same. So there will as such be no timing issues. So let us look at the different technology generations. So the physics of the optical drive has remained the same uh, over the last few generations. So the physics per se has not changed. It is just that uh, now you know, we have the technology to have a far more compact uh, encoding of the bits or lands and pits are smaller. So we can fit in data <coughs> in a more compact fashion. So we can fit in more data per uh, optical disk. So the first generation of optical disks were CD drives. So they were mainly meant for audio users. You know, you can have a lot of songs on a CD. So you can also have a movie, but a part of it. And that also not HD quality. So 700 megabytes was its storage. And it used a 780 nanometer wavelength laser. And uh, so recall that visible light is between 300 to 700 nanometers. So it was kind of an off red kind of spectrum. And the raw transfer rate, which is called a 1x transfer rate. This basically means the transfer rate when the CD is first released. But in a lot of CDs, you'll see 8x, 10x, 50x, 52x. This means that later on, there have been subsequent improvements and the transfer rate has increased. But the raw transfer rate when it was first released was roughly 153 kilobytes a second. 
which is pretty slow it's good for audio but not for video the second generation uh, was a dvd drive which is 4.7 gigabytes in size so its uses were that it could uh, be used for videos so and entire movie could fit on a dvd even though you know not necessarily hd quality but a full movie could fit uh, this was achieved so the laser wavelength uh, became slightly smaller mainly because we have to detect smaller features so smaller wavelength is required and the tr raw transfer rate increased significantly to 1.39 megabytes per second which is good enough for video the third generation which you know has been there for 5 or 6 years but it has not really had a lot of traction uh, these are blu-ray discs uh, 25 gigabytes in size so they offer us a significant amount of capacity so a lot of videos you know a lot of videos 3d videos and uh, and the like are actually released on blu-ray discs and uh, hd quality good videos so the laser wavelength that is there on blu-ray drives so blu-ray drives are different from cd or dvd drives that uses a 405 nanometer laser wavelength and the raw transfer rate is 4.5 megabytes per second which is uh, you know much much higher than uh, the previous technologies so that's the reason blu-ray should be the technology of choice especially when we are dealing with very very high definition you know video hd quality or 4k quality right so that's when blu-ray should be used but blu-ray for some reason has not been a very popular technology but that's you know that has nothing to do with the technology it's more about licensing and standardization and so on now let's look at the third category of drives called solid state drives so solid state drives or flash drives are used in all our pen drives and usb sticks so which are very very common nowadays almost everybody has a pen drive or a usb stick and we transfer a lot of our data with pen drives so we should know how it works so the crux of all of this uh, you know technologies is a new kind of a logic gate called a floating gate transistor so a floating gate transistor looks very similar to a regular nmos or a pmos transistor with some differences so it has two gates it has a control gate and a floating gate so this part so let me actually draw it so we have a source terminal and a drain terminal and of course we uh, we have space for a channel so similar to traditional transistors there is an sio2 layer and the gate is there on top of it right so you know which is polysilicon so in a typical uh, nmos transistor it's polysilicon this is not the case here uh, so then uh, what we have is that, so after this there's a metallic pad which connects the source the drain and the gate however in this case uh, things are slightly different they are different in the sense that we have two gates so this gate over here is a floating gate and then we have another sio2 layer and we have one more gate on top of it which is called a control gate so uh, the symbol for this is actually you know it's a regular transistor but we have an additional horizontal line here basically for the floating gate so that's the reason it's called a floating gate transistor so the physics is like this that we when we apply a very high voltage to the control gate electrons get deposited in the floating gate so let's say if i apply a very very strong positive charge electrons will sort of flow from the channel inwards and get deposited in the floating gate and uh, as a result this will increase the threshold voltage of the transistor so the floating gate transistor is said to be programmed so the value that this is holding uh, let's say that when a transistor is programmed the value it's holding is zero and when it's not programmed the value is one so when it's not programmed there are no electrons in the floating gate but when it is programmed there are electrons in the floating gate and the value is zero so initially we start with one then we make a transition to zero when it is programmed how is it programmed apply a positive very high voltage between the gate and the substrate electrons will migrate and deposit themselves in the floating gate 
This will increase the threshold voltage of the transistor significantly. So we say that the gate is programmed. Uh, so, so that is the only thing that you need to learn. I need to make one correction now. I said something which is incorrect. So the correction that I'm going to make is that I said that uh, the materials of the floating in the control gate uh, are not necessarily polysilicon, but I should, you know, add a correction. So uh, as of now, the materials for both the uh, floating gate and the control gate you know for both of them at least as of now you know as of 2017's technology is polysilicon even though in the future it can change but at least as of now it is polysilicon so so this is one correction i would like to make that uh, you know i just so, sort of want to you know give people an idea of what the current technology is but of course, you know, these things keep on changing. So maybe tomorrow the material can change, but not, uh, you know, as of now, it's still uh, the traditional materials, which is polysilicon at the gates and doped silicon uh, at the substrate and the drain and the source. So now, uh, how do we read the value in a floating gate transistor? Well, so the way we read the value is like this that since uh, depositing electrons increases the threshold voltage, we have th two threshold voltages now. We have a normal threshold voltage, which corresponds to an unprogrammed state. And we have an increased threshold voltage, which corresponds to a programmed state. So Vt and Vt plus, where Vt plus is greater than Vt. So now when the cell contains a logical one, the threshold voltage is Vt. When the cell contains a logical zero, the threshold voltage is Vt plus. So we set the gate voltage to a value between Vt and Vt plus. So in this case, if the cell has a logical one, it will conduct, right? Any transistor, uh, if we, any NMOS transistor, if it uh, has a voltage between Vt and Vt plus, uh, and you know, it is not programmed, it will conduct. However, if it is programmed and it's a logical zero, then the threshold voltage is Vt plus. So it will not conduct. So that is exactly how, you know, we evaluate uh, a floating gate transistor by setting its gate voltage uh, to a value between Vt and Vt plus. So depending upon whether it's conducting or not conducting, we can deduce what it is programmed with, 0 or 1. So there are two ways of organizing floating gate transistors to actually form a memory. One is called NOR flash and the other is NAND flash. The NOR flash is not considered to be very efficient, so it is not used. In comparison, NAND flash is used. So in NOR flash, the idea is like this, that we sort of connect them as a NOR gate configuration in the sense we connect them in parallel. And uh, not, not in parallel, but the way we uh, connect transistors when you're building a NOR gate, a right, CMOS NOR gate. So let's say I take two floating gate transistors, connect them to separate word lines. One of their terminals is connected to ground and the other is connected to a bit line. So if any of these floating gate transistors, you know, if let's say WL2 is set to, is enabled, which means that the threshold voltage is set to somewhere between VT and VT plus, and you know, the other transistor is not enabled, right? It's meant to be off. Then if the voltage on the bit line approaches zero, we will know that this transistor is programmed. So it has a logical one. So sorry, we'll know it is not programmed. So it'll, uh, we'll infer a logical one. However, if this does not approach zero, this will mean that the threshold voltage is higher and uh, it is programmed. So it contains a logical zero. So this kind of a configuration per se is rarely used uh, because you know the density is low, the bandwidth is low, even though it is faster. So we'll see why it is faster than NAND flash on the next slide. But recall that the main philosophy is that we want to share bit lines between transistors 
Otherwise, we can't dedicate a separate bit line for each transistor. There will be too many bit lines. So managing them will not be possible. Here also we can uh, use the same logic as an SRAM and DRAM. You can see chapter 6 where we pre-charge the bit line to a certain value and depending upon the way that the voltage is going either towards ground or towards VCC, we can use a sense amplifier and figure out what is the direction and the logical bit. So I'm not you know, going into the details because I've already we have discussed this ad infinitum in chapter 6. So basically the term that you should be googling for is pre-charging and sense amplifier. So then that will give you the additional background. But I'm not discussing it right now. Right? So these are the two terms, pre-charging and sense amplifiers. So what is, I what is used is called NAND flash, which is a different and more efficient method of actually storing data on a uh, flash drive. Right, of creating a flash drive. So what we do is that instead of having them in parallel like we had it in the previous uh, slide, we have in this case eight floating gate transistors with of course their separate word line enabled signals uh, connected in series. Then we have a bit line select and a ground select normal transistors which essentially enables uh, all, all of these transistors you know, at least one of these transistors. So they are mainly, you know, enabling switches, right? So this is like a switch. This is like uh, one more switch, but these are enabling switches. Otherwise we connect them in series and they are all connected to one bit line. So to read a certain transistor, what we do is we enable the rest of the transistors. So all the rest of the transistors are enabled. So the voltage is basically higher than VT plus which ensures that irrespective of their level of programming, all of them will conduct. We enable ground select and bit line select. And after that, for let's say if you want to read the value of transistor WL6, we set a voltage between VT and VT plus and we see if it conducts or not. If it conducts, then it means that it has not been programmed. So we have a logical one, otherwise we infer a logical zero. So one advantage here is that we are able to pack more transistors, reduce the number of bit lines, right? And so this allows us more density. So the density is much more than NOR flash. So recall that uh, we had seen SRAM and DRAM devices, which was different in the sense that every bit was connected to bit lines, but here we are being far, f being far more economical with bit lines. The most important thing you need to realize is that any flash device is not a memory device. So let me write. There is a very, very important thing that all students need to know that any kind of a flash drive or a solid state drive is not a memory device. No, it's a storage device. Sorry, this. It's a storage device. So the difference between a memory device and a storage device is like this, that a memory device is supposed to be used very frequently within the normal operation of a program. And it, you know, very strongly determines the performance of a program. However, a storage device does not determine the performance of a program. A storage device is mainly meant for archival that, you know, I have a homework, I put it on a flash drive, take it somewhere else. I have a song, I put it on a flash drive, take it somewhere else. So storage devices are more about, you know, number one, reliability. You don't want the data to get erased. Number two is that you're looking at, you know, storage space. You know, so you want more space and, you know, more compact storage. So storage devices have, you know, very different requirements as compared to memory devices. That's the reason we can afford to have these things to be very slow. And uh, we can uh, be very economical with the number of bit lines. So for example, let's say we want to read these eight bits. The only way would be to enable the rest seven, read one, then enable the rest seven, read two. That is slow, but in a storage device, we can afford that. The reason being uh, that uh, we are not really looking for performance here. We're looking for compactness. We're looking for additional storage and we are looking for reliability. So let's now consider 
the terms blocks and pages. So typically uh, on a flash drive, uh, again an artifact of it being a storage device, aspect of th that, we say that a page contains somewhere between 512 to 4096 or 4KB of data. So most NAND flash devices read or write data only at the granularity of pages. So they don't provide byte level access or they don't provide access at the level of 8 bytes or 16 bytes. Rather, uh, these devices will only read and write big massive chunks of data. So they are meant for bulk transfers, like transferring a song, a video, right, in you know, a huge bulk transfers. They are not meant for small transfers. And for small transfers, we use, you know, memory devices like SRAMs and DRAMs. Also, there are many, many additional bits for error correction and the code that is used is CRC. Recall that CRC is very effective when it comes to burst kind of errors, a bursty nature of errors. So uh, after defining a page, which is somewhere between half KB and 4 KB, we define a block. So a block contains somewhere between 32 to 128 pages. So the size is somewhere between 16 to 512 KB. So we can erase data at the level of blocks. Okay, sorry, it should be off. So we can erase data at the level of blocks. So, so uh, what do we do for reading, writing? We do it at the level of much smaller uh, level things called pages. But erasing basically means uh, that well, uh, we need to provide a strong, uh, you know, reverse voltage so the electrons move out of the floating gate. And this, uh, you know, there is one big circuit to do it, but it's fairly inefficient to do it at the level of single transistors or even at the level of pages. So we do it at the level of blocks, which are actually a lot of pages. A block contains a lot of pages. All of them are erased in one go, which means that they are deprogrammed, set back to logical one. So uh, as a result, what we follow is a program erase cycle where basically we write a page, then we go and write one more page, we go and write one more page. And let's say we don't need the data anymore, then the entire block is erased. We again start rewriting the pages. So rewriting a page, you know, unlike a memory device, it is not possible that once a page has been written, we can rewrite it. Because, you know, converting a 1 to a 0 is somewhat easy because this is called programming. And, but this is also done at the granularity of pages. So once something has become a 0, it cannot be converted to a 1 unless we erase. And erasing is a very expensive operation. So that's the reason we keep on creating more and more pages. And finally, we erase, you know, blocks of pages, right? 32 to 128 pages, we erase in one go. So converting these zeros back to ones or deprogramming is slow and has to be done at large granularities. So that's the reason every page follows a program erase cycle where first it is programmed. Then of course it's accessed many, many times. Then when, t when the time comes, it is erased again, reprogrammed again, erased and so on. So let's now take a look at some of the reliability problems and some issues that can happen uh, in flash drives. So flash memory can only tolerate a certain number, typically 100,000. Nowadays it's more though, of program erase cycles or PE cycles. So recall, if you take a look at the previous slide, that we write data in pages and we erase data in blocks. But pretty much once you have written to a page, there's no way to rewrite it. We can only erase it and rewrite it. So that's the reason we have a cycle of a program, erase, program, erase, and so on. So what happens after repeated PE cycles is that the SiO2 layer, the silicon dioxide layer breaks down and does not remain an insulator anymore. Hence the device cannot hold charge anymore, right? So the SiO2 layer via which you know, electrons kind of migrate and lodge themselves in the floating gate. That does not remain an insulator during normal operation, uh, operation of the transistor. So basically the transistor breaks down. So what is the solution? Well, the solution is that we keep counters for each block. Uh, for each block, we have counters. 
so they uh, we increment the counter for each pe cycle so for each pe cycle we say that in you know, the first pe cycle second third fourth and so on and uh, we try to balance the number of pe cycles across the blocks that's the aim so in that sense the entire flash drive will degrade gradually otherwise what will happen is that there will be too much of traffic for one block and we will not have enough traffic for other blocks so that issue will be there so uh, let us look at two things wear leveling and read disturbance so wear leveling basically says that once you know a counter reaches a high value at least as compared to the other blocks we swap the contents of a frequently accessed block with a less frequently accessed block the way that we do this is that we actually have a mapping table similar to what we had on a hard disk so basically for every flash drive uh basically software thinks of it as a array of bytes which we always do we send it a logical block number a logical address from which we find the logical block number it maps this to a physical block number within its storage area right a physical block once the p count of this becomes very high and we find another block which has you know a relatively lower p count we essentially swap the contents how do we swap the contents well that is very interesting so we always we locate one more block which is empty we'll always have some such blocks which are empty we'll ensure that there are always some such blocks that are empty so then what we do is that we uh, transfer the contents of this block to this block the empty one right uh, we erase this block then we transfer the contents of this to this then again we erase this block and transfer the contents from the temporary block to this block and all of this is happening unbeknownst to the user then we change the mapping from this block to this block so in this uh, fashion what happens is is just by doing these swaps and changes in mapping we are able to ensure that the pe counts the pe program erase cycle counts of each and every block roughly remains the same Uh, across uh, the entire storage drive so this ensures that you know no block uh, degrades faster than others and the entire storage drive in a sense degrades uniformly and after a certain time of course in you know, the faults will start to come because you know the pe counts will actually be very high but that will be after several years and in any case pen drives don't have that long a life but till its active life we are, we are essentially trying to maximize its life maximize its active life by doing this and this is called wear leveling because we are trying to level the wear and tear and the wear and tear here is defined as a pe cycle across uh, all the physical blocks and the way this is achieved is very similar we always have uh, such mechanisms in computer architecture we had a page table we had a tlb we have had all kinds of mapping tables where essentially we send a logical address the address perceived by the program and the programmer and what the table does is that the table gives us a physical address and the physical address can be changed depending upon the constraints of the device there are some other reliability mechanisms as well so it is called read disturbance so it is possible that uh, by repeatedly reading a transistor the contents of the other transistors change for example in nand flash you know when all the gates are connected uh, in this fashion by repeatedly reading this what are we doing we are essentially enabling the rest of the transistors to allow us to read the value here so what will happen is that this will uh, cause the contents of the other transistors to change in the sense that the floating gates might lose some of their charge and this will essentially cause it to either uh, cause it to get uh, deprogrammed right or in some cases it can also cause it to get programmed so uh, to avoid this we can have a counter same approach have a counter with uh, uh, you know each block to find out the number of reads or each page or each block to find out the number of reads that have happened once the number of reads uh, exceeds a threshold we can always swap the blocks 
you know take it from one point to the other uh, or what we can do similar to a DRAM refresh we can uh, read the contents of the block and write it back again so then you know this problem will uh, go away so we need to do something of that type right uh, so we just cannot remain quiet because otherwise you know errors will crop up in the data that's the reason we also need to maintain the counts of the number of reads along with the number of PE cycles and ensure that uh, we the uh, number of reads never crosses a threshold if it does then of course we need to either swap blocks or we need to read the same block and write it back again something like that has to be done so now thankfully finally ultimately we have reached the end of our 12 chapters and it, at least in this edition of the book which is the first edition we have completed all the 12 chapters the lectures of all of them uh, around 45 50 hours so hopefully you got a very very good idea of the basics of computer architecture uh, by now so this is definitely not the end uh, i'm writing an, another book on advanced computer architecture which will be in the market in maybe a year or so and uh, we will pretty much start from this point 